Hello. Hello, everyone. So we're going to wait a couple of more minutes before we start. We will start at one sharp, like usual. John, you wait two more minutes. John, John, look what it's doing. Can you hear her? I can hear her, but um, look at my picture. Oh, that's your picture, right? Does anyone yes. of you follow the actual Tour de France, the I second tour by any it. chance? I, I personally don't. Don't worry about your picture. <laughs> well, it's annoying. Some of you do. Else no, they don't see it. See that minus? For sure. Oh, stop video, maybe? Yeah, just stop the video. Okay. They can't hear you, right? Unless you talk. Yeah, unless I unmute. Okay, you're good. That's good. You had too much electricity. Stack electricity in your hair was making. Mm -hmm. All right, it is one, we can start. So thank you everyone for joining the Tour de France again. So this is the fifth session of the program. Uh, I can believe it's only, we're already halfway through and there are still more uh, presentations to go, but yeah, we made it to, to half of it. So thank you for uh, following this program. If you have followed it all along, thank you very much if you're joining only today. Staying, still thank you. Um, so as a reminder, this session is going to be recorded and you will be able to find it on the YouTube uh, channel of the Princeton Public Library. Uh, the last couple of ones have not been uh, uh, uploaded yet, but my colleague who is taking care of uploading them on YouTube has just come back from vacation, so they should be available quite soon, as well as this one in, I guess, only a few days. All right, so let's go for today's destinations. All right, so today we're going to go to Lyon, Marseille, and Nice, so big cities that are located in the southeast of France. So today we're going to stay mainly in the same area in France. So first about Lyon, which is located over there. So if you remember, for those of you uh, who followed the one about uh, Fort de France, Grenoble, and Andai, so when I talked about Grenoble, this one is located over there, so it was... Uh, so Lyon and Grenoble are actually uh, not very far apart, which was very convenient for me as I lived in Lyon between 2019 and 2021, and my husband was doing his PhD in Grenoble. All right. Oops, sorry. So Lyon is France's third largest city. There are about 500, uh, more than 500 uh, people who live in the city itself. But if you count the urban area uh, surrounding Lyon, there are actually more than 1.5 million people who live in the Lyon urban area. Uh, it's divided into nine arrondissements, and its nickname is Capital of the Gauls. So the Gauls were uh, Celtic peoples who lived in the territory of France 
before the country was actually France. It was founded in 43 BC during the Man Roman Empire. And at that time, the name of the city was Lugdunum. Uh, it's where the cinematograph was invented by brothers August and Louis Lumière in 1895. So without those two brothers, Hollywood uh, <laughs> wouldn't be Hollywood. Uh, and according to uh, food critic Kornansky, who was dubbed the Prince of Gastronomy and writer Bill Bufford, uh, uh, Lyon is the gastronomy capital of the world uh, and was home to very renowned chefs like uh, Paul Bocuse, Eugénie Brasier. Uh, so Eugénie Brasier was actually the first uh, French chef uh, who had six, accumulated six Michelin stars, three for her two restaurants, as well as other renowned chefs. So what can you do when you are in Lyon? So first, you can have a stroll in the Old Lyon, which is the medieval and Renaissance districts, and it's divided into three neighborhoods, Saint-Georges, Saint-Jean, and Saint-Paul. So each of those neighborhoods hosts a church, uh, and the biggest of these three neighborhoods is Saint-Jean, which is home of the Saint-Jean Cathedral, which was built uh, between... Um, sorry, which was built between 1175 and 1480 with later restorations. So while you are uh, walking in Lyon, in the narrow streets of Lyon, you can try to look for traboules, which are passageways connecting the streets to courtyards, like those ones. So for example, uh, while you are walking in Lyon, you would see like a, a medieval door. And so you can actually enter. And so you would cross that courtyard right over there being quiet because people still actually live in these buildings. And so you would cross this courtyard and exit through another door that would give on another street in the old Lyon. So here you have two examples of traboul and passageways and the courtyard that, uh, that's hidden uh, and you can access only through the traboul. Uh, in the old Lyon, you have actually, you can see a lot of uh, buildings and houses that are very colorful and that follow the uh, Florentine, um, um, sorry, influence. And most of them, so like, yeah, and mentions that were inspired by Florentine architectures. And you would find as well a lot of shops like craft shops and bouchons, uh, which are uh, traditional uh, restaurants from Lyon. If you are interested or if you are curious about watching movies that are actually set in Lyon, you can have a look at The Clockmaker, which was a movie directed by Bertrand Tavernier and released in 1974, which is available on Canopy. I watched it and I really liked it. And so this movie is actually set in the sample neighborhood, but you can uh, sometimes they go to Saint-Jean and to other neighborhoods of Lyon. So over there, you can see uh, a basilica at the top of the hill, and that's where we're aiming at in just a minute. So after going to Old Lyon, you can either take some uh, quite long stairs or take a funicular to access Fourvia Hill, and at the top, you would uh, encounter an ensemble of Roman vestige, um, so which is which consists in a sanctuary, thermal bath, uh, the ancient theater of Fourvière, um, and an Odeon, a singing theater. So the theater was actually built between 15 BC and the second century. It had a diameter of 108 meters, about 355 uh, feet, and could sit. Uh, about 10,000 people. So it's quite huge. Uh, unfortunately, so this theater, uh, after the decline of the uh, Roman Empire, uh, so stones were taken out of the theater to use to build some other buildings, and it was completely covered uh, during uh, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance eras, and it was actually found again at the late uh, 19th century or even the early uh, 20th century. Uh, and so it forms a pair with the with the Odeon, which is located right next to it. So if, uh, right next to the theater, you could go to the Lugdunum Museum, which is um, so which was inaugurated in 1975, and it's the Museum of Gallo-Roman Civilization. 
which offers a permanent collection of statues, mosaic, jewelry, inscriptions, or everyday objects uh, that were found uh, from the Roman era. And so you can see it from there, but it's actually located inside the hill. So I will show you in just a few moments uh, a picture that will, where you will see the, the museum itself. And so a few meter, a few hundred meter further, you could go, uh, you could have access to the Basilica of uh, Notre Dame de Fourvière, which was built between 1872 and 1896, uh, which has a Neo-Byzantine architecture and has an overlook over the entire city. So this is the Basilica right over there. So from the Old Lyon, which is located right here, this is the St. John Cathedral. You could take some stairs. There are a few stairs that go like all the way from the Old Lyon, or you can take a funicular from St. Jean to uh, the Roman ruins that are located a bit away from there. Uh, so as I said, so this basilica is of uh, Neo-Byzantine uh, architecture style. And this one is actually dedicated to Virgin Mary. It has two levels, uh, a basement that is quite bare, which is actually a Roman uh, Romanesque crypt. Uh, and the upper church on the other hand is very ornate. So that's what you can see over here. Uh, the Basilica of Notre Dame de Fourvière attracts 2 million visitors uh, per year. It's one of the main attractions of the city of Lyon. And so actually, uh, all Lyon and Fourvière Hill and some of the neighborhoods are part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site that protects the historic center of Lyon. Uh, so this is a view with everything that I mentioned that you can find on the Fourvière Hill, so the Basilica over here the theater over there. And so what you can see over here, so the little squares and rectangles are actually windows from the Luc Duno Museum. This is the entrance right over there. So if you go back to the old Lyon and you want to visit the museum, a one that I really enjoyed when I was living in Lyon was the Cinema and Miniature Museum. Uh, so it's actually located in a house that was built between the 14th and the 16th century, which is called uh, La Maison des Avocats, so the lawyer's house. So part of, the, of this museum is dedicated to movies, special effects and tricks. And another part of the museum is dedicated to Dan Allman's collection of miniature scenes. Dan Allman is actually a miniature, uh, miniaturist artist who bought the building and created the museum. So the cinema collection offers more than 500 authentic objects from as many movies, from costume to props to decors, models, animatronics. Uh, so this is like costumes and animatronics from uh, Tim Burton's Batman. Uh, there were as well, if I remember correctly, uh, the doll from Chucky. You can see Gizmo from the Gremlins, uh, some of... Uh, extraterrestrial animatronics from Men in Black, and even a triceratops from Jurassic Park. So those, obje those objects were the real ones used in the movies. You can find as well uh, the whole decor of some scenes from the movie, The Perfume. And so, yes, a lot of, uh, a lot of different objects. So if you're a movie fan, like, yeah, I think you would really enjoy the, the atmosphere of this museum. Uh, so the other uh, collection of the museum, so is actually uh, a whole set of uh, miniature scenes that were uh, designed by Dan Allmans. They are extremely detailed and they are actually faithful reproductions on a 112 scale of uh, places in Lyon, like the theater, the opera, uh, a prison as well. Uh, so in this space, uh, you would have as well some exhibitions of works by other miniaturist artists. So this is an Ewok as well. So a real uh, costume, Ewok costume from Star Wars. And so this is the outside view of the, um, of the museum, which is located in that building right over there. If you want to get away from the old Lyon, you can go to the Parc de la Tête d'Or, which is the biggest park in the city and as well the biggest urban park in the country. So it 
it's a very good place if you want to like have a stroll or like if you want to run or cycle uh, and even uh, boat during the summer you can swim in the lake though because it's uh, not under surveillance um, and it's probably deep as well uh, in the park you will find a 20 acre zoo that shelters more than 400 animals uh, which has as well an African plain with giraffes, zebras, cattle, as well as a uh, garden, uh, roses, and the bot botanical gardens as well, uh, which includes a 6,000 square meter uh, greenhouse and more than 7,000 uh, square yards uh, greenhouse. Uh, and it offers about 16,000 species of plants. So this is a, a view from the, the zoo in the EBC's area. And this is a, a view from one of the greenhouses in, in the park. So very green, very lush, I would say. So Lyon is quite a vivid city that offers quite a few festivals all year round, starting with the Quai du Polar, which is a festival dedicated to suspense literature. So from crime uh, fiction to detective stories, thrillers, uh, they talk about every kind of uh, suspense literature uh, through panel discussions, conferences, uh, book signing sessions, movie and series screenings, uh, and they offer as well detective games in the street of Lyon and exhibitions. So since 2005, uh, authors from six different nationalities have been invited. Uh, in summer, you can go to Les Nuits de Fourvia, which is a music festival that runs in July in, and takes place in the antique theater that I mentioned earlier. So this festival is quite old because it was uh, created in 1946. And over there you can see musicians and singers from uh, pretty much any kind of genre from like yeah, rock, French songs, uh, rap and so on. The Festival Lumière is a, uh, is a movie festival that was created in 2009 and happens usually in October. Uh, so during this festival, you can see a retrospective of restored very, very old movies, uh, more contemporary movies. And I think that usually as well, they, um, they schedule an entire night at the, theater, at the movie theater where they choose a series of movies, like for example, uh, The Lord of the Rings or The Godfathers, and they would show, they would screen the three or four, uh, like yeah, the whole series of movies during the night. So you could spend a whole night at the movies, which is my dream. Oh. And unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, enjoy that mostly because of COVID. And finally, uh, the Fête des Lumières. Uh, so relies on a very old tradition of placing tea light candles on your window sills on December 8th. Uh, so at first it was to celebrate uh, Virgin Mary, who supposedly saved the city from the bu bubonic plague in the 17th century. So for that reason, Lyon is actually nicknamed also capital of lights. And so the municipality of Lyon from that tradition, organized uh, started to organize a whole festival of light, uh, light and sound shows uh, around the city, most of the time in the city center uh, and on the big, bigger squares of Lyon and on very emblematic um, uh, buildings. For example, uh, so this is the big square uh, facing the opera uh, and close to the um, city hall, sorry. And this was a show uh, of light and sound uh, projection projected on the St. John Cathedral. I was actually on, uh, on that square on that very same uh, day for that festival, uh, which was absolutely gorgeous. It was very, very impressive. And still now uh, inhabitants place candles on their windows on the 8th of December. So the festival usually happens uh, the week of the 8th 8th of December, and that date is already uh, is always uh, part of the festival. So as I mentioned earlier, Lyon is a uh, capital of the gastronomy. So if you go to Lyon and eat traditional uh, dishes from Lyon, I'd rather tell you that uh, the cuisine from Lyon is quite meaty. <laughs> 
it's quite good, but meaty. So uh, I mentioned Bouchon earlier. So Bouchon are traditional Lyonnais restaurants that serve local fare, such as sausages, duck pate, or roast pork that are very uh, common in the cuisine of Lyon. And always they would serve it with local wine. So to start your meal, you can have cervelle de canu. If you translate it word by word, it gives you silk worker's brain, but don't worry, you're actually not uh, eating brains. Um, so it consists of cheese spread uh, made of a base of fromage blanc, like a, the closest thing from it would be cottage cheese, uh, seasoned with chopped herbs, shallots, salt, pepper, olive oil, and vinegar. So yeah, <laughs> no brains, no brains in there. Uh, then, as a main course, you can try the quenelle de brochet sauce nantua. So, uh, the quenelle, so, which is this yellow thing over here, so is actually a mixture of cream fish or meats, in that case, pike, uh, combined with semolina or flour and served with a cream sauce made of crayfish. With that, you could try the saucisson brioche which is a dry sausage from Lyon, uh, cooked in brioche, possibly with pistachios or truffles. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the meal, you could try, oh, sorry, you could try the tarte à la praline rose, which is a pink praline pie uh, that's very, very sweet and quite rich. Uh, heavy cream is actually one third of the recipe. So like, yeah, keep, uh, keep, quite a big place in your stomach at the end of the meal if you want to try that because like it's 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 a bit heavy it's quite good but like in if you have some i would advise you to have just like a, a tiny tiny piece of uh, of that bite because it's very very sweet as well so i remember that every time i tried it it was in very low quantity uh so uh, as i mentioned um before, so in restaurants in Lyon, you would have uh, local wines as well. So it's a good occasion to talk about the wine that you can find in the region. So the closest vineyard uh, from Lyon is the Coteau du Lyonnais, which is located about 10 kilometers, six miles away uh, in the west of Lyon. It's quite a small vineyard, only 250 hectares, 600 acres but in the ensemble of the Rhone Valley. So the Rhone Valley is actually the second biggest wine production area in France. The first, if you remember correctly, being Bordeaux. So the Rhone Valley production, wine production area is more than uh, 66,000 hectares, uh, 165,000 acres. There are more than 5,000 vineyards in total and 31 appellations in the area. So, uh, a very popular wine that grows in the area is, or an appellation that is cultivated in that area is the Côte du Rhône, uh, which is produced from Vienne, which is located 30 minutes away from Lyon, <clears throat> in the south to Avignon, uh, way down south, so across 171 towns and villages. So this uh, vineyard, um, or this type of wine, is cultivated uh, across uh, 30,000 hectares, like 75,000 acres production area, and is actually divided in two. So you would have the Northern Côte du Rhône and the Southern Côte du Rhône. So I have a quick question for you. How many bottles of Côte du Rhône wine are produced each year? Just give a number either so you can unmute yourself or uh, write, in the, write it in the chat. How many bottles of wine of Côte du Rhône do you think are produced each year? 5,000. Mm. 5,000. 10,000, that's more than that. That's, that's really more than that. Oh. Um... All right, I'm gonna Wait. give you the answer. So that's actually about 167 million of bottles that are produced oh of Côte du Rhône each year. Uh, to give you an idea, so that represents about half 
uh, of the whole production of wine in the entire Rhone Valley. Uh, so throughout the, the Rhone Valley, there are about 346 millions of bottles that are produced each year. And so in the Côte d'Orne, a lot, lot of uh, the production is actually of red white. Uh, so 86% of the wine produced is actually red, a very few amount of rosé and a fewer amount of white wine. And there are some uh, very good wines, some cru that you can find not so far from Lyon. Among uh, the most famous one, you could find some Côte Rôti, Condrieux, and Chateau Grillet. To give you an idea, uh, the most expensive uh, bottle uh, that you can find in the Côte du Rhône area, uh, or even for the Rhone Valley, for the Rhone Valley, is made at the Saint Joseph Vineyard, and you can count about two uh, k for a bottle of Vieille Vigne. So yeah, here you have a better idea of the geography of the Rhone Valley uh, wine production area. So as you can see, Lyon is actually so at the top north over here. And so uh, the wine production stretches quite a long way to the south of France. Uh, so this is the northern part, uh, northern Côte du Rhone area production and southern Côte du Rhone area production. And now let's go to Marseille. Here you have a, a nice view over, over the city, a nice panoramic view. So Marseille is actually the oldest French city. It was founded in 600 BC by the Greeks. Uh, and it's France's second biggest city in terms of population. There are about 870,000 inhabitants, but its territory is actually 2.5 bigger than uh, Paris territory. Marseille as well is divided into seven arrondissements, which are divided themselves into 111 neighborhoods in total. Uh, you may have heard about Marseille soap, and this has actually been produced, uh, starting being produced more than 600 years uh, ago. The first documented soap maker was recorded there in about 1370 of our era. And Petanque, uh, Petanque is a very popular uh, sport and leisure in Marseille. It was actually officially invented in 1910 in La Ciota, a small town close to Marseille. So it's very popular in winter or even, like, uh, not in winter, in summer, sorry, or even all year round if the weather permits, just like see people playing petong throughout the city in parks and like everywhere where there was like a, a good terrain to play. Like, yeah, you would always see people playing petong. Uh, so what is there to see in Marseille? I would say first you should aim for the old port, which is the historic heart of the city. Uh, where actually the city of Marseille was founded. It used to be a trading port in the past, but now it's a marina. And so the old port is still a vibrant hub today uh, with lots of bars and restaurants. And it's also a place of popular gatherings and events. And from the Vieux Port, you could uh, take a shuttle to go to some islands uh, offshore uh, of the shore of Marseille or the Galang that I'm going to tell you about in just a few minutes. Uh, so there's a, a trilogy that was uh, written by um, Marcel Pagnol, a writer from uh, Marseille and the, the area. Um, so Marius, Fanny and César are three plays that have been adapted into movies that are available at the library if, you, if you're curious and you want to uh, see what uh, the life in Marseille in the, I would say, Mm, early second half of the 20th century look like. So as you can see over here, there's uh, another uh, church and that's our next stop right there. So if you're brave enough, you can climb uh, the hill by foot or you can go uh, by car at the top of the hill uh, where you will find the Basilica of Notre Dame de la Garde, which offers a panoramic view of Marseille as it's the culminating point of the city. 
it's located, as you can see, south of the Vieux-Port. So this basilica has been nicknamed La Bonne Mère, the Good Mother, and it was built uh, in the second half of the 19th century, like uh, uh, the Basilica of Notre Dame de Fourvière, and like the latter, it has a Romanesque crypt and a, a neo Byzantine uh, upper church. Um, so, like, yeah, same kind of style, uh, not really in the material used, but like neo Byzantine uh, architecture from the other part and Roman crypt uh, in the basement. So in this one, you would find a lot of Roman mosaics to um, uh, that actually are the decor of the uh, upper church. Uh, so it's decorated with uh, 1,200 square meters, so about 13,000 square feet of mosaics. And the floors are covered with approximately 380 square meters, more than 4,000 square feet of Roman mosaics with geometric pattern that you can see over here. So yeah, as you can see, wow. it's very ornate, uh, very gilded as well. Uh, and the, the mosaics are pretty impressive. So at the, if I, Go back. So, the monumental uh, statue of the Madonna and Child measures about 11 meters, so 37 feet. Uh, it's made of copper gilded with gold leaf. And um, <clears throat> sorry, so in total, it culminates. Uh, so, if you take the, the ground of the, um, of the church to the top of the, of the statue, so it's about 60 meter height, 65 meter height. So the statue of Virgin Mary is actually hollow and there's a staircase that leads to a rise, but it's actually off limits to the general public. Uh, and the, um, in the Basilica, there are three bells and the heaviest weighs eight tons and is called Marie Josephine. And so the Basilica of Notre Dame de la Garde is actually the most visited monument of the city, which attracts about 1.5 million visitors each year. If you want to know more about the uh, culture uh, of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, area, you could go to the Museum, the Museum of European and Mediterranean Civilization, which opened in 2013. So it's divided into three sites, the J4 Esplanade, so the main site actually where you have uh, the main collection and the biggest exhibitions, and as well, uh, most of the cultural programming, uh, the Fort Saint-Jean that you can access through this small bridge over here, uh, which is a smaller um, space of exhibition, uh, used to be a military fort and or a historic monument built in the 12th century. Uh, and finally, a resources and conservation center, uh, which is located a bit further. And this part is actually the museum's backstage uh, and also a small exhibition center. So in this museum, you would find more than 250,000 objects, uh, 350,000 photographs, 200,000 posters, prints, and postcards, as well as uh, 150,000 artistic works of Mediterranean subjects from uh, the Neolithic to contemporary arts. So all that is, all those objects, all those artworks are related to uh, Mediterranean subjects. Uh, and it's the most visited museum in the whole city. It attracts about 500,000 people per year. And you have many more people who go to the Esplanade just to, uh, just to chill and enjoy the, the shade from the structure over there. And if you're tired of the urban area and want some more nature, you could go to the Calanque National Park, which is located between Marseille and Cassis and stretches over 20 kilometers. That's about 12.5 miles. I'm just going to give you, so yeah, uh, an overview of the geography. So this is Marseille. And so the Calanques are actually located all along the coast over here until Cassis. So there are some more actually that are not, uh, that are located a bit further away as well as on the, the other coast, if you uh, go more to the, 
uh, to the west and a bit north. But yeah, so this is the area of the uh, Parc National des Calanques. So the Calanques are actually up over there. So what is a Calanque? Uh, yeah. Uh, so Galangs are actually miniature fjords uh, of uh, various sizes. Uh, there are 25 located in Marseille and one on the territory of Cassis. Um, <clears throat> so like yeah, Galangs are miniature fjord with turquoise waters and pebble and fine sandy beaches, um, mostly made of uh, limestone. Um, so to access the each of the Kalank, it's a bit challenging if you want to go there by foot because as you can see, it's quite steep. So you have to be quite fit and you have to go there mostly under uh, good uh, weather circumstances to avoid to sleep and have any accidents. So if you want, you can access the Kalank uh, by the water. If you just like take a cruise uh, along the Kalank or if you like to sail or if you like to kayak, that's a very good way to access the, the Kalank of this national park. So this park is actually the, is as well the habitat of numerous animal and vegetal species. Um, <clears throat> it, it's the habitat of about 80 species of birds, some reptiles, 900 vegetal species, 60 marine species. And the national park was created in 2012 to protect the flora and fauna of the area. Uh, and so this park, uh, this park attracts about 3 million visitors per year. Uh, so yeah, you have a, a better view of some of the Kelong. So I can guarantee uh, that, it, so those pictures might be a tiny bit photoshopped, but the water is as clear in, in reality. I had the opportunity to uh, visit my best friend who lived in uh, Marseille for a five or six years, and she took me to some of the Calanque, and I was very impressed by uh, the clarity of the water, and it was absolutely gorgeous. So if you have the opportunity to go to this area and to go to Provence, you should definitely hit the Calanque of Marseille. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so Marseille is quite a big city that offers uh, a lot of uh, festivals, cultural festivals. Most of them happen in the summer. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Au les Beaux which is a literary festival that usually happens at the end of May. And its name is actually taken from Samuel Beckett's play, which in English is Happy Days, but in French it's Au les Beaux Jours. Uh, so this literature festival offers workshops, public readings, lectures, conferences, signing sessions, panel discussions, performances, concerts, and screenings. Um, the, the aim of this festival is to make literature dialogue with other arts. The Festival of Marseille is a multidisciplinary festival, like you, you can see dance performances, uh, plays, concerts, installations, movie screenings, uh, talks, you can go to parties as well. Uh, it lasts about three weeks uh, from mid-June to early July. Uh, Feed Marseille is uh, the Marseille International Film Festival that happens every July, uh, where more than uh, 130 movies are screened from documentary to fiction and attracts more than 20,000 spectators per year. And finally, Marseille Jazz de saint Continent is an international jazz festival that usually happens in July uh, for about three weeks, and it has been on since 2000. So for the foodies, so you can, uh, when you go to Marseille, you can start your meal with uh, some tapenade spread, which is made of chopped up sorry, chopped or pureed olives, capers, and anchovies. So you would just like spread that over, but, uh, over bread, sorry, and, and have it as a very nice appetizer. Bouillabaisse is uh, without any doubt the uh, most emblematic uh, dish that you can eat in Marseille. It's actually as old as the foundation of the city. It evolved during the time, but it's still a fish soup. 
which, which is made of different fishes from red cascas, red gornard, monkfish, John Dory, uh, sea robin, conger, sea urchins. You can add even more uh, fish if you want. So all of those are cooked in a broth with potatoes, garlic, onions, tomatoes, olive oils, uh, herbs, and spices. And so the tradition is to serve the broth first uh, and on a separate plate uh, than the fish. So what you can see actually on the picture. Um, <clears throat> so in the broth, you can eat it with slices of bread covered in rouille sauce, so kind of uh, dark red uh, sauce that you can see. I think that's what would be, oh no, that's actually what would be over here, I think. Um, and so the fish comes in a separate place, in a separate plate, sorry. And so you could actually mix uh, fish and the broth, but the tradition is to serve them separately. Uh, you could try as well some pied paquet, uh, feed packets to translate it in English. So the recipe has been attributed to Louis Genouves, a cook from Marseille, who is said to have created this recipe in 1880. So it's made of uh, sheep's feet and stuffed sheep's stripes stewed together in a sauce made of tomatoes, garlic, parsley, onions, uh, and white wine, as well as herbe de Provence. And you could try as well some navette, which is a cookie usually made for candle mass. It's shaped like a shuttle for weaving and is flavored with uh, orange blossom. And when it comes to drink in Marseille area, you should definitely, uh, you could definitely try a rosé wine from Provence. So Provence is actually the main region uh, in France that produces rosé wine. Um, and so you can have that on the terrace, like with or without your meal as an aperitif as well a very popular uh, drink uh, to have for aperitif as well as pastis. So it's an anise flavored spirit. And so like you would put like about this quantity of uh, pastis and dilute it with water. And so it's very fresh with some ice cubes. And so playing pétanque while drinking a pastis is actually very emblematic of Marseille. So final destination for today is Nice, which is located at the very uh, tip of France in the southeast. So Nice is France's fifth biggest city. Uh, about 340,000 people uh, live in the city uh, and it makes it the capital of the French Riviera. Uh, so it's the economic and cultural center of the, of the French Riviera. It's located about 30 kilometers or 18 miles away from Italy. And so it was actually, uh, it is still culturally and linguistically influenced by Italy, even more so as sovereignty of the city changed several times uh, in history. So for example, at some point it belonged to the Savo Kingdom, then it belonged to Italy. It actually, um, so it actually has belonged to France since 1860. And this is one of the sunniest place in France with about 300 sunny days per year. So if you don't like the rain, this is definitely a good destination for you. Uh, this is on the UNESCO World Heritage List for its architectural heritage of the Belle Epoque, Art Deco and Baroque architecture. And it's the second city with the highest number of museums. You can guess that the first one, that the first one is Paris. Oh, sorry, trouble. Whoop. So while in this, you should definitely maybe start to go uh, visit the city where by going to the beach. Uh, so Nice's Bay is actually called the Angels Bay, the Bay des Anges in French. So in Nice, uh, the beaches are only pebble beaches. There are no sand beaches. Mm -hmm. If you're tired or just uh, tanning on the beach or swimming in the sea, you can have a stroll on the Promenade, Promenade des Anglais, 
a seven kilometer long or four mile avenue running along the coastline. So that would be this over there that runs like even way further down and a bit further on that side as well. So on this avenue, you would see numerous palaces, hotels, and former villas, as well as casinos, like the Negresco, which is um, emblematic of, like, of the architecture that you can find in Nice. So this building is actually um, <clears throat> both uh, neoclassical and baroque in its architecture. And here you have a closer, closer view of uh, Pebble, Pebble Beach in, in Nice. Uh, after a nice swim, you could stroll uh, along the city uh, of Old Nice, which is the historic district where you would find lots of villas and palaces built between the 17th and the 19th century, uh, most of the time for uh, rich people who uh, came to Nice during the winter. Um, they were called, in that case, the winterners. Um, and so, yeah, so along with the palaces, you would see as well some buildings with yellow and ochre facades. Uh, and it's still quite a lively area with a lot lots of markets, restaurants, uh, bars, and, and craft shops. If you climb on Castle Hill, which has no castle, by the way, you will have a panoramic view over the city. It's actually the view that you would have from the first picture. Like, yeah, if you go to Castle Hill, that's the view that you would have from Nice. So the castle from which the hill takes its name uh, was built in the 11th century, but uh, it was destroyed by order of Louis XIV in the 18th century. So when Napoleon III came to Nice in 1860, he went to Castle Hill and had a view over the city of Nice and said, this is the most beautiful landscape I have ever seen. It is beyond what I had imagined. It is admirable. So if you want to follow Napoleon III words, maybe you should go to Nice to have a, a very gorgeous view of the bay as well. If you like uh, Matisse, there's a very good Matisse museum uh, in Nice, which is located uh, in a renovated villa from the 17th century that was inspired by um, a Genoese uh, Italian style with its colored facade, trompe decorations, and numerous windows. So Matisse actually lived in Nice from 1917 to his death in 1954. Uh, so the collection that you can find in the museum, um, <clears throat> so it follows the artistic development of the painter from the 1890s, sorry, to his latest works. And the collection is still, itself is made of about 600 works and personal objects donated to the city of Nice by the painter himself and his heirs. Uh, so in total, you would see 31 paintings, 454 drawings and prints, 38 cutouts and 57 sculptures, uh, as well as more than 400 paper cuts and cutout elements he never used that were donated by his family uh, in 2012 directly to the museum. So um, I had the chance earlier this year to go to the Philadelphia Museum of Arts uh, and actually go to the Matisse in the 1930s exhibition. So some of the materials that was uh, displayed at the Philadelphia Museum of Arts directly came from the Matisse Museum in Nice. And this museum actually helped curate, helped curate this exhibition. So if you went there uh, to see this exhibition, you actually saw some of the uh, works exhibited in that museum. And if you want some more nature again, uh, you can go to the Parc de la Grande Corniche, which is located uh, at the right at the east uh, exit of the city. Uh, it stretches over 712 hectares, which is about 1760 uh, acres. And so this park is uh, spread over four villages. Es, La Trinité, La Turbie, and Villefranche-sur-Mer that are uh, located uh, on the coast as well. 
Um, so from there, you will have a beautiful viewpoint over the entire Riviera uh, from actually um, from San Remo in Italy to Saint Tropez. You will also have a view over the Alps uh, in the north. So this park is the habitat of 450 plant species, uh, as well as bird of play and prey, uh, and European gecko and many other animals like foxes, boars, badgers, uh, eagle owls, eagles. Uh, there's a bird observatory as well if you want to um, go bird watching in that park. So when, it's come to, when it comes to cultural events, the main one is the Carnival of Nice, uh, which is the biggest carnival in France, and it attracts 1 million spectators per year. Uh, so it was officially, uh, at least in, institu institutionalized in 1873, but there are records uh, that date from the 13th century that mention a carnival in Nice. So the tradition, the carnival tradition in Nice is very, very, very old. It lasts about two weeks uh, over three weekends in February. And so uh, each year a theme is given uh, and the floats, puppets and costumes um, of the people on the floats are created following this theme. The puppets of the uh, king, queen, uh, prince, and more than 100 giant heads are created each year following a specific theme. So none of the puppets are used one year after the other. They're all created each year for the carnival. Um, so there are about 17 floats that are made each year uh, and 15 for the flower parade. Uh, and each parade lasts about one, uh, one hour and a half and takes place in the city center of Nice. Uh, along the garden and in um, Place Masséna, which is uh, one of Nice's biggest squares. <clears throat> so parading with the, with the flows and with the puppets, you would have as well um, street art troops like stilt workers, jugglers and dance and dancers, uh, and costume groups and musicians who would perform uh, and would be coming from all over the world. So the flower parade, parade itself is one of the highlights of the carnival. Um, so to create the floats and the costumes, um, there are more than 100,000 stems of flowers that are used and 20 tons of mimosas are distributed to the public each year. Uh, and actually 80% of the flowers used are locally produced and produced like roses, mimosa, carnations, gladioli, um, and 3,000 to 4,000 stems of fresh flowers are needed to make each float. So that's quite huge. And they are all decorated by hand. So that's a very, um, at the same time, last minute work because the flowers have to stay fresh and a very precise work. So the, the workers are, are very passionate uh, about flowers and working for this carnival. And so at the end of the carnival, like many of the carnivals uh, in France and maybe in other countries as well, uh, the giant puppet of the king is burnt, is burnt and there are huge fireworks. So here are more pictures of the carnival of Nice. So this is a uh, a float from the flower parade. So as you can see, so there are lots of flowers uh, on that float. And uh, so you have different species, roses, uh, I would guess lilies maybe. I'm quite bad with, them, quite bad with plants to be honest. <laughs> so uh, those are traditional dancers uh, of Nice. Uh, this is uh, a giant puppet of uh, the prince or the king, and this is a, a night view of the Nice Carnival. Other than uh, the Carnival of Nice, uh, there are other <clears throat> festivals organized all year round, like the Nice Jazz Festival, which takes place every year uh, in July since 1948. 
Uh, L'image satellite is a three week festival of pho photography that usually happens in fall in September, October and showcases new experiments uh, around the art of photography. And uh, the Journée du Cinéma Italien is a film festival focusing on the emerging Italian cinema. Uh, it usually happens every year in spring and uh, in 2020, sorry, in 2023 was the 37th edition of that festival. So what can you eat? while you are in Nice. So Nice is, uh, nice is very renowned for the quality of its olive and olive oil. So you would have olive oil produced in Nice pretty much on every dish the, that you have over there. So the first one is the salad niçoise, which is made of raw vegetables, like tomatoes, green peppers, red or spring onions, garlic, celery, purple, artichoke, fava beans and lettuce. And I'll hard-boiled eggs, anchovies or tuna, either one, but not both. Uh, nice was black olives and olive oil, but never, never, never put vinaigrette or mayonnaise on, on a salad nice was. That would be a blasphemy, only olive oil. Then you can try a pisaladière, which is uh, which finds its origins in Genoa in Italy. It's a kind of kind of pizza, I would say. Uh, so it's a flatbread made of bread dough garnished with caramelized onions, anchovies, and or pisella, which is an anchovy paste. Nice was black olives again, and olive oil. And ratatouille, that you may know at least by ear. So ratatouille is an emblematic dish of Provence that has many variations in the world. So essentially, it's a dish of stewed vegetables. Uh, tomatoes, onions, zucchinis, eggplants, bell peppers, garlic, leafy green herbs, uh, cooked all together in olive oil once again. <laughs> and as dessert, you can try the sweet card pie, uh, which is a dessert with chopped uh, chard leaves, pine nut and raisins. So there are a lot of variations with more uh, ingredients for that dish, but so... Uh, Chard leaves, pine nuts, and raisins are the three main ingredients um, for the sweet and sweet chard pie. All right, that's it for today. That's almost an hour. That went fast. So thank you for your attention once again. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them on the chat or to unmute yourself. Uh, next week, we're going to Orléans, Paris, which I guess you were all waiting for, and Quimper in Brittany. Any, any questions, comments? Very interesting mm -hmm. and enjoyable. And so, yeah, once again, this video should be uh, uploaded on the YouTube channel of the Princeton Public Library. Uh, so, yeah, on the Princeton Public Library YouTube channel in just a few days, uh, as well as the previous ones in just the next few days. All right, so thank you everyone for your attention. If you have uh, any questions that you don't think about right now, but might pop in your head in the next few days, I'm always available um, by email. You can send your email to refstaff at princetonpubliclibrary.org. Uh, Princeton Library. Ah, Petank. So Petank is, um, is a sport. So uh, basically you have, so it, hmm, how to explain Petank? Uh, so it's a sport where you throw uh, metal balls uh, on a terrain. Uh, which is quite elongated, I would say, like mostly uh, of like a gravel, uh, yeah, gravel, gravel kind of ground. Uh, and so first, so the aim of the game or the sport is to actually throw your metal ball the closest from uh, a little, uh, a smaller ball. And so you make, uh, you make points if your ball is the closest from the, the smaller one, which is called the, the cushionet, the piglets.
but it's very popular in the south of France and it's spread it actually across the whole country. So pretty much everywhere in France, you would see people playing pétanque in the summer, but in Marseille, it's really like a, an institution, like everyone plays pétanque. All right, thank you everyone for attending this session and I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bah, merci. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you.